I'm Stephen Engel, the Chief North Asia Correspondent for Bloomberg Television. Um, thank you very much for um, being here and, and continuing the conversation all morning on the, um, the year ahead. And this time we're going to talk about corporate governance. Uh, it's an interesting topic, obviously. I've been covering the Nissan issues with Carlos Ghosn for the last... Oh my goodness, since November 19th, almost every single day. So I've been quite deep into trying to understand corporate governance in Japan and trying to see where it's falling short. Uh, I want to start, though, by getting your participation, by putting up a poll question, if we may, uh, because I want to get a sense of what you feel uh, the shortcomings might be in corporate governance here in Japan. Um, you can use the app, again, pigeonhole.at. If you need the password, I'm sure somebody will tell you, TYA2018. This is the poll question. Over the past couple of decades, now I've just used this as a, as a random uh, time period. It happens to coincide with the period that Carlos Ghosn was at Nissan, uh, but it, it's not necessarily tied to that. In the past two decades, has Japanese corporate governance and transparency improved, deteriorated, or hasn't changed the status quo? Hmm. So there you go, already immediate results. It has improved. Well, I don't know. It hasn't changed. Status quo is catching up. We just got news this week as well. There's a very influential, and KT will talk about it in just a minute, the latest corporate governance rankings uh, by the Asian Corporate Governance Association, based in Hong Kong, I believe it is. Mm -hmm. uh, Japan, in the latest results, came out number seven among 12 markets in the Asia Pacific, tied with India. Now, two years ago, it was number four. So it's dropped three spots in two years uh, in the rankings of corporate governance and the effectiveness of corporate governance. Now, I assume perhaps in 2015 or 2016 when that ranking came out, it was fresh on the heels of the corporate governance code that was adopted uh, in Japan. But since then, there might have been some backsliding, according to the Influential Association. Um, so now that we have the audience assessment, and we're, I guess it's going to be running throughout the hour if you still need to add your... Um, uh, two bits. I want to introduce the panelists that we're going to be discussing, and I have to say, we're probably the most diverse panel here, okay? <laughs> More so than Japanese Topics 500 companies. We'll get into diversity in just a minute. Um, I'm sorry, you're the guy Gokujin on the, on the, on the panel here. <laughs> KT Rabin, uh, Glass Lewis, CEO, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, we also have Takumi Shibata, Nico Asset uh, Management President and CEO. And then, Mickey, you also kind of bridge Gaikokujin and Nihonjin. You spent 20 years in New York as well. Mickey Tsukasaka, excuse me, a Boston Consulting Group Managing Director and Chief Marketing Officer. Uh, thanks so much for your time. Do these results surprise you, or is this something that you think is true, that most people believe that corporate governance in the last 20 years, despite the number of scandals, whether it's Nissan, Kobe Steel, Toshiba, Olympus, the list goes on. Corporate governance is improving. Becky, do you want to start? Now, there are a lot of polls that compare Japan to the rest of the world, and we always come out a little bit short on these things, whether it's diversity or board diversity, internal, external. I choose to focus on the positives. I do think there's been progress, and when bad stuff happens, bad stuff happens, and that might make the company an even better company thereafter. So that would be my view, that we need to make progress. It's not fast enough. Shibata-san, it's not good enough, is it? Oh, well, actually... I didn't say it was good enough. <laughs> I just Better. said we could focus it on the half-full part first. I think it's a great that uh, there are uh, you know, efforts uh, published in uh, 2014 in the form of a stewardship code and also in 2015 in the form of corporate governance code. And it's a very good start of a journey. But it's a journey. Uh, so we are taking this uh, quite uh, seriously, uh, especially in uh, our duty, if you will, uh, as a third party asset uh, manager to do what's right uh, in the fulfillment of responsibility as a very good steward. So last year we essentially tried to cover about 2,000 companies in a direct stewardship contacts uh, with the 3,700 meetings. It's interesting, because if uh, you were to do a math four times a year, 2,000 companies, 
you need to contact 8,000 companies. So we are kind of half, halfway there, part because of resource constraints and part because uh, especially smaller companies are not used to meeting with the you know, asset managers. But uh, you know, efforts are being made and it's our responsibility to make sure that by ticking the boxes, uh, they are so home free. Ticking boxes, like a minimum number of non-executive directors, only a start. And it's a start of a long journey. I can, I can add some statistics. Um, you know, when we were talking and preparing for this, I, I was thinking about, you know, what's the story in Japan? And I think it's a good news, bad news story. Um, from our perspective, the, uh, uh, and I think I speak also on behalf of our clients, we, we provide services to 1,300 institutional investors globally that the decision um, around the uh, update to the corporate governance code to not include some of the things that were originally proposed, right. which would have required a third, uh, minimum of a third independent directors on the board. Um, and that was you know, probably of all of them, that was the big ask. And, and more uh, diversity on the board as well. Um, so, you know, that doesn't mean though, the fact that this didn't happen and that the, that the uh, uh, corporate governance code didn't adopt those, and I think that's probably what's largely responsible for why the ACGA, uh, I haven't, you know, the story broke today on that and, uh, and the details will come out, but I suspect that when the story gets written in full that that's probably going to be the big issue there. Um, that said, I think that, you know, there's been a lot of uh, positive change in Japan, and I pulled up some statistics. Over the past two years, the percentage of Topics 500 companies that have reduced cross shareholdings, which tend to undermine shareholder interests, was more than 70%. Uh, percent. Um, the uh, uh, percentage of Topics companies with two or more independent outside directors has risen from about 18% in 2013 to 88% as of July of last year. Um, and also companies with anti-takeover measures have declined more than 30% from their peak in 2008. So there's been a lot of progress, um, but on some of these key topics like uh, independence, um, that is, was a, a fairly big disappointment. And what I think is going to happen is, you know, Nico Asset Management and uh, other firms like Nico um, all over the world are still going to be pressuring uh, companies to do the right thing. They, they, they don't see these, this code as the maximum standard. They see it as a minimum standard, right. and there's going to be this expectation that they do more than what the standard calls. Rather than just ticking the boxes on what they need to do, yeah. and I'm going to use Nissan as an example because they did not have those semi-required. I mean, the code of conduct is not necessarily right. built into law. It's yeah. suggestions. Uh, they did not have those two outside until this year, and those two ended up being a race car driver and someone from the energy sector. Yeah. Okay, they might be connections to Nissan, but are they the right people? So are, are the right steps being taken? Those numbers support what you're saying, that maybe they're going in the right direction, but are the right people, the right independent people coming to the board with an outside view being implemented? You know, I would say, um, as a woman in Japan, um, the last thing I want to see is a woman that's not qualified to serve on a board be a board member. And I would say the same thing for the, the men and the boys, too. Right? And I do think the, the starting point is the issue because we have been far behind relative to other um, you know, major economies in the world, on, particularly on the Western Hemisphere. And if you look at, uh, you mentioned the topics, um, top companies, Katie. If you look at the top Fortune 500 CEOs and the top CEOs of Japan. Uh, Fortune 500, uh, last I looked, 27% of them started their careers at that company. I think a country like the US has had much more mobility by the time people rise up. And the number in Japan is 82. So 82% of Japanese CEOs started when they were 22 years old as a young engineer or a young marketer or young finance guy in that company and they stay. And so, you know, I think, as Kate mentioned, I think all of those statistics are going in the right direction, and it's all about openness. And all, those of us in Japan talk about how we're an island country and we're insulated from the world. And indeed, that's just been the common practice. And there are fantastic companies that have organic CEOs, and they have fantastic companies that have brought in outsiders as well. So, 
One of the sort of key challenges that uh, Japanese corporations have in meeting requirement for having at least two outside directors and also making an improvement upon it is shortage of supply. And also oh, the other uh, challenges is the lack of long-term history. Mm -hmm. uh, the starting a long term history in the Western world, if you're a chief executive of a major company for five years, for instance, you had to have experience of dealing with the non-executive directors for five years. And therefore, they know what it takes to be a very good uh, non-executive director. And when they retire from the position of a chief executive, they can become a non-executive chairman or they can become a non-executive director essentially knowing what it means to be a guardian of investors' interest and what it means to be a person who is responsible for governance. There is a distinct difference between execution of business mm -hmm. and the governance of business. And this transfer is almost sort of natural in the Western society. The challenge that the Japanese corporation will have is that the none of the chief executives for a long time had to deal with the non-executive directors for most of their career, and therefore they don't really have a role model to be a very good outside director. Likewise for women. And basically, uh, currently, with all respect, I think uh, uh, consulting companies are very good suppliers of female executives, and also universities are also very good uh, suppliers. Looking for a job after this one. That's so. right. Yeah. Uh, of female executives, <laughs> but the corporations have not been a good supplier. And this sort of thing will take time, and uh, probably we need a sort of 15 to you know, 20 years before all those things become natural. So until that happens, a positive effort by players like uh, government and ourselves and also uh, major pension fund sponsors like a GPIF mm -hmm. need to basically control to hasten the process. 20 years is a long time. So, but, yes, I can't <laughs> Maybe <laughs> a little bit faster would be good. So I, I'm going to display or, uh, my ignorance about things that happen here in Japan. I mean, in, in, in North America, there are, and, they, and there are more of them. In the time that I've been at Glass-Lewis, I've been with the company since it was founded. And in the 15 years that I've been with that company, I mean, in 15 years ago, the job of voting proxies was handled by compliance people, people with no connection to investment management. Uh, and today... Uh, you know, the people doing the proxy voting are typically people who sit within investment management um, and uh, take those uh, uh, the responsibility very seriously. The issues that are on the proxy are substantially more complex. And also, what's also kind of, you know, around what's happened on the institutional investor side, we have seen a variety of initiatives and organizations that, are, that exist in order to develop potential directors. So is that... Is that something that does or doesn't exist here in Japan? Uh, actually, yeah, we have a very good system uh, in our own company, and we are not really alone. Uh, we do have a group of executives uh, whose job is to do research or fund management, and they gather uh, at the time of proxy voting. And last year, we said that no to 9.5% of candidates uh, of uh, non-executive directors and also we said 100% no to any TOB defense measures being proposed by the company. Uh, so that's the job by the people who have an interest in making those companies better. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, because we insist on the better corporate governance in publicly traded companies, we need to basically walk the talk. Yeah. So we do have uh, uh, you know, governance oversight committee that is run by non-executives, uh, making sure that we do the right things. But how prevalent is the issue? And I'm going to go back to the Nissan, and I'm not asking you to comment specifically on Nissan, but you had a, a very high-profile chairman and then a representative director who had the company CHOP in Greg Kelly, who had all the different departments, legal, compliance, human resources, everything, report directly into him, rendering pretty much um, the rest of the board had no say in a lot of these moves. I mean, how can this, if corporate governance is improving in a company that is so large and also very diverse in some senses, having a foreign 
uh, chairman and CEO, it, how prevalent is this kind of structure in the board where the minority board members, if you will, don't have anything to say? Actually, the, one of the complexity of the situation is that uh, that company is 43% owned by another company. Yeah. A French company. And that is a very large shareholder. Okay. So control by sort of a shareholder uh, is maybe somewhat greater. And it's a job of a non-executive director to make sure that the minority shareholder's interest is actually protected. I think by uh, looking at uh, allegations, so far I would uh, essentially uh, stick to the word allegations because we don't really have hard evidence in front of us and the court is yet to render any judgment. But uh, you know, the stories that's coming out basically tells you that the uh, extent of information that was made available to non-executive directors and the extent of uh, influence given to non-executive directors may not be up to the standard. May not be but, up to the standard. Uh, you know, they're sort of, be, sort of be unique in having very large outside a shareholder. Okay. Steve, I have to say, though, you know, when there's a crisis, I guess, what is it? Do you, do you use the crisis, so to speak? I've talked to a handful of CEOs in the past week or so. I've actually talked to some external board members of very prominent and fantastic Japanese companies. They're all talking about it. Mm -hmm. And there could be um, rules, regulations, you know, like the French. You could have quotas so that you have to have 40% women, which is why France is now ahead of the U.S. Yeah. Um, and you can wait for those rules. But in the end, it's a room full of 12, 15 people and with the right leadership, I, again, I'm in my half full positive mood about Japan today, um, I would hope that the right conversations are being had right now to revisit some of those things. Right. If they look just like what you described, they know that investors will be saying, so how do you guys go about it? So they're raising the questions. Yeah, do you want to? I no, want I to want to you. interject, though. It's, it's what's really important, though, too, is for the companies to communicate what they're doing. Yes. So it's not okay to sit in a room and discuss these ideas <laughs> and then not disclose it. And, and also, you can't rely exclusively on the meetings that you have with your top shareholders because realistically, you know, your shareholders are not, you're not going to be able to meet with every shareholder that you've got. I agree. And so you've got to come up with a way to communicate what you're doing. I mean, at Glass Lewis, we, you know, we've been accused of having a sort of check the box approach to doing uh, proxy analysis and providing recommendations. And, and that, I, that's actually never been true, but what was true up until a few years ago is that we didn't talk to companies. And now we talk to over 3,000 companies a year. And probably, you know, if I'm in those meetings, I have this thing that I call my mantra. And I, what I want to leave every company that we meet with is, is for them to understand this mantra, which is don't let what you have to say get in the way of what you should say. You need to go beyond what's required in terms of disclosure, and you need to tell your story. Because in these situations, when you're asking shareholders to kind of trust that you're on the right path and you're moving in the right direction and you need some time to get there, you need to be able to, to explain with some teeth, you know, with some real measurable steps that they can kind of monitor that you're making progress in that direction and you need to explain it in your disclosure. Actually, uh, you know, Katie is uh, saying a very important thing. That's external uh, transparency. Mm -hmm. At the same time, some of the challenges that the Japanese boardroom discussions face is that there are too many items being discussed and subject to resolution so that, that there is no time to discuss anything. <laughs> they, go, they go down a list of the agenda. <laughs> so actually, uh, importance of uh, players like a non-executive chairman would only increase, and especially they need to uh, exercise their influence upon mm -hmm. boardroom agenda setting. Yeah. So uh, what we are trying uh, in our shop is uh, to ask a non-executive chairman to join us, and then he would uh, dictate the board agenda. Not enough, but uh, long term, we want the boardroom to discuss important things, uh -huh. as opposed to so many minor things that uh, consume people's time and money. And uh, actually, the time and talent of non-executive directors are very sort of expensive and precious, and we need to make the best use of it. And that should come from 
uh, shift in uh, probably a little bit of uh, what is required under Japanese corporate laws, but more in a form of changing company bylaws so that uh, real governance would uh, take place in substance. Yeah. Well, and it's ironic because Japan has more corporate board meetings than any other, yeah. I think, OECD country. Right? They meet every month. And so I think it's the quality of conversation versus maybe the quantity of uh, items on the agenda that could be another uh, lever. Will there be one takeaway from this Nissan scandal, whether the, the introduction of non-executive chairman is a possibility? Is that coming to Japan? That's what we are trying to test. Uh, you know, again, uh, most of the corporations would have a chairman who is graduate of CEO position, all internal. So the uh, corporate hierarchy is built in such a way that uh, you know, it is not easy to change uh, governance structure. But the time will come, and we are testing the water by ourselves. Well, I beat it at the chest saying this is a diverse panel, and I need to talk about uh, gender diversity on the Japanese boards. We know that the female participation is very low. I have numbers from Jeffries, since we're all throwing around statistics. <laughs> 93% of directors at the Topics 500 companies are Japanese men. There are only 267 women in total on the boards of Topics 500 companies. One half of the total, 263 companies, have boards that only have Japanese men as board members, no women, no foreigners. Is this, how is this going to change? Does this have to change? <laughs> I think it will, and it has, um, but it shouldn't take 20 years to get there. I do think, um, boy, if you look at the statistics, um, there is a positive correlation, whether it's correlation or causality. If you look at the number of um, female board members, just to take gender. There's a seven point difference in EBITDA versus companies that don't. There's a three point, four point difference in ROE. So the, 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 the business economics are there. So I think that's, Stephen, you know, one of the ways to trigger it to say diversity actually is good for business. It's not check the box, you know, I have you know, found somebody else that can wear a skirt to a meeting. So that's one. Um, I think the, the, the second part of it, though, is that we should look at the companies that are doing it well. And I have some other statistics that say, in fact, um, one-third of the largest corporations in Japan at least now have one female board member. Yep. Okay. And <laughs> then this is a, a, a sadder statistic. 19 companies actually have more than three. So the 19 has to become 190 eventually. Um, and I think there's some learnings there in terms of, again, what kind of diversity, whether it is female, external perspective. When you introduce a foreigner in the room, suddenly you have to have bilingual documentation. And given the number of meetings, it is a huge, I mean, when we as um, uh, uh, consultants to the company, when we have to present to a, a board that has, you know, different nationalities, right. our workload goes up too. But I think it's really important. One good part, so it's uh, diversity in all sorts sorry, of Shibata ways. Sorry, Shibata-san, you don't have a say in this. I'm, <laughs> I'm just, that's a joke. That's a joke. <laughs> we talked about the old boys club. I said some of the boys are pretty good. So that's okay. I, I'm good with old boys. I'm an old girl. So, I'm sorry, you know. please. I couldn't resist. Uh, actually, uh, you know, the one good thing that uh, you define is the fact that the many uh, headhunters are busy trying to find candidates from female side, at least, to be on the board of directors. So demand is up. The question is supply. Right. Yeah. Katie, how important is it in, from your US perspective to have diversity on the board? Yeah, so um, this is, you know, you've heard, I think we talked a little bit about this. This is a big trend in Europe, and it is lapped up on the shores of, of North America. Um, and as such, Glass-Lewis has been sort of pondering whether or not we were going to have, when, it wasn't whether, but when we would actually have a policy uh, that would call for a minimum number of the underrepresented gender on the board, which in 99.999999% of the time, the underrepresented gender on the board is, is a woman. Um, and what we've done, because we we know we don't want to drop this bomb on the companies that we're analyzing. Um, so we, we, when we put out a policy like this that's not 
you know, it goes beyond what the, what the codes and laws and listing rules require, we telegraph that this is happening. So actually last year in 2017, we telegraphed that in 2018 we would have a policy for Japan, which I'll read in a minute. Then we reminded companies again in 2018, yes, in 2019 this is coming, so be prepared. Um, and we're engaging with lots of companies in the market, and when we, we sort of put out the word that we were open to engaging with companies, and then when we didn't hear from companies, Naoko Ueno, who oversees our Japanese research and has been with Glass-Lewis a long time, just so you know, our coverage of Japanese companies is the second oldest practice at Glass-Lewis. We started covering Japan after North America before any other market in the world. Anyway, so, so Naoko actually said we need to give the market a couple of years to be prepared for this. As of 2019, Glasslewis will recommend against members of the board, uh, members of the board at companies that do not have incumbent or proposed female members at topics core 30 and topics large 70 companies. We will generally recommend against the chair of the company or the most senior executive in the absence of the company chair under the two tier board or the one tier board with one committee structures. Uh, we will recommend against the nominating uh, committee chair under the one tier uh, with three committee structure. And in the case of the two tier board, we will uh, examine the board of directors and the statutory board as a whole. In the case of one tier with three committee structures, we will consider whether the company has any female executive officers. So basically, uh, for those of you in the room, if you didn't know this before, if you didn't hear it when we warned you, it's coming. And it's really, I mean, for us, it's we already had clients who were we're voting against, you know, in, in, in many ways we took sort of direction from the clients and the way they were voting in this area and, and we're following now in that. We're out of time, but can you just bring up the poll results so we can just kind of recap and see if the room has changed its opinions at all based on the discussions <laughs> or do we have it? I'm not so sure. But we could probably have another half hour, two hours to talk about this. We didn't talk about the rise of dual class shareholdings in Hong Kong, whether it's coming to Japan and the interests of minority oh, shareholders. Yeah. There's so much to talk about. Uh, That's top of mind among uh, global institutional investors right now. Dual class shares uh, is of a great, great concern. And yeah. Yeah, they're worried the about voice the of minority shareholders yeah. again. Okay, thank you very much. Thank Please, you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.